This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, you know, it's been said, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. That's but you right. know what? Do let them get involved with agriculture because without ag, Georgia cannot grow and Kenny and I wouldn't have jobs. <laughs> hey, so glad you joined us for another edition of the Farm Monitor. I am Ray Delessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. If it's ag news you want, it's ag news you're going to get. Straight ahead on the program, what is citrus greening and how could it affect the rapidly growing citrus industry here in Georgia? Also on the program, how's the drinking water quality for your cattle We've got a checklist of sorts to help determine that all-important question. Plus, well, hey, everybody, Ranger Nick back with you celebrating our 50th Ranger Nick segment. Can you believe it? And this month, we're spending some time with some special critters outside of Atlanta and finding out how a special center is helping these little guys. I'm going to introduce them to you. That and so much more starts now on the Farm Monitor. Discovered in Florida in 2005, citrus greening has wreaked havoc on the state's orange crop, resulting in more than $3 billion worth of losses. Well, now it's a problem Georgia growers need to be on the lookout for, as there have been recent signs of it around the state. Damon Jones explains. While citrus might not be the first industry that comes up when talking about Georgia agriculture, it is actually one of the fastest growing within the state. And a big reason for that is Georgia producers filling the void after a sharp decline in orange acres across Florida, thanks in large part to a devastating disease called citrus greening. So depending on who you ask, um, it's taken out about half to two thirds of citrus in Florida. Um, it's had a major, major economic impact on them and their citrus industry, and they've been battling it for quite a while. More than a decade, in fact, battling a disease that slowly stars the tree of its nutrients. Citrus screening is a um, bacteria that is spread by the Asian citrus psyllid. Um, citrus screening is also known as HLB. Um, it's a phloem limiting bacteria. So basically the phloem is moving the sugars and metab metabolic products um, from the leaves down the plant. And it's restricting that um, and over time kills the plant. While the disease can't be 100% confirmed without proper testing, there are some things you can see on the leaves that indicate a problem. There is some visual diagnostics that lead you to move that way. Um, the main one is some blotching of the leaves. Um, so with a nutrient deficiency in a tree, you'll usually have symmetrical yellowing in the leaf, usually around the leaf veins. Um, with citrus greening, you'll see um, yellowing, but it'll be asymmetrical. So if you fold folded the leaf in half, the yellow wouldn't match up. Even though the effects of this disease might not happen overnight, the impact on the fruit is eventually devastating. You can have greening on the tree for one to two years a lot of times before you'll see any visual symptoms that there's something wrong. Usually what I've seen, and I'm no expert or plant pathologist, but um, a lot of times they'll still produce palatable fruit for a couple years after that. But eventually, as the tree's continuing to decline, the fruit will become misshapen and it'll have a bitter or salty taste. So it'll just be unpalatable. Unfortunately, there is no cure for the tree once it's been infected. That means it's essential to take preventative measures to help minimize the risks. You can do preventative insecticidal sprays for the psyllid that carries it. Um, those are best done usually in um, late spring, early fall. Uh, the psyllids are less active in summer when it's as hot as it is today or in winter time. So just how much should growers in the state worry about this disease? Well, if Florida is the example, it's a problem that should be taken very seriously. So the biggest concern is for our commercial citrus growers here in Georgia, which is really a bigger industry than most people realize. Um, it's mainly, of course, going to affect, affect South Georgia, kind of all the way across. Um, because that's where we can grow citrus. You know, for further north in the state, we, we get a little too cold for most of our citrus varieties there. Reporting from Camden County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. All right, Damon, thank you so much. Now, meantime, here in the South, we're known for being a little bit more family-oriented and friendly. Well, recently, the Monitor met a family who's taken the whole Southern hospitality thing to the next level with their family business, Hunter Cattle Company. John Holcomb reports. 
I do not care it's not every day that you see this, an entire family getting to work together. But here on this family farm down in Brooklyn, this family is lucky enough to do just that. I got the chance to spend some time with them and hear their story that started about 15 years ago. We all wanted to be on a farm, produce our own food, and uh, so it was 15 years ago that we moved out. And the, the first thing we wanted is to produce food for ourselves and, you know, to have a garden, you know, we, to have some fruit trees, nut trees, um, raise our own animals. You know, that was just like something we really wanted to do together. They started raising cattle and processing the meat from them. They became known after people discovered their dry aged beef. People started asking for it, so they decided to make it into a family business. So we were on the farm doing our regular jobs, construction, and this and that, and you know, people found out what we were doing and wanted to buy from the farm, and that's what we do now for a full-time living. Business has been good. So good, they decided to open a market. It's stocked with products they make from the farm and also has other products people might need. My wife, who is called Muma, Muma by her uh, grandchildren, uh, she said, well, let's just open up a little farm store. And I told her, I said, ain't nobody gonna come out here to this farm to buy anything, and little did I know I was wrong. One of the most interesting things, though, is their farm hands. With this being a family farm, Ferguson's grandchildren help out as much as possible. They do whatever is needed, like move cattle. It's wonderful to see them learning responsibilities on the farm. Uh, they actually work, and we've had some people to say, well, you know, you don't think you need to take it easy. Well, they enjoy it. They. They like working, they like going out and accomplishing things. Ferguson thinks it's good for them and that more kids need to grow up working on farms. You know, when you give a child a task and uh, even if it's hard, when he accomplishes it, it's something that you can't teach in school. And I think a lot of kids miss that opportunity to actually work and uh, accomplish goals and to have the satisfaction of actually doing something and learning things on them for themselves. At the end of the day, he's just glad he gets to work alongside his family, doing what they all love. I thank the Lord for the opportunity that we've had to, to move out, live on a farm, to live together. You know, I, I get to see my grandkids, most of my grandkids, just about every day. Reporting in Brooklyn for the okay. Farm Monitor, okay. I'm John Holcomb. Well, hey everybody, hard to believe we're celebrating our 50th Ranger Nick segment, and I, along with Sammy and Jeffrey, are gonna show you what a special center is doing to help wildlife like this guy on the other side of the planet. So much of what we do is interacting with people, whether it's people dropping by in the office, or you going out in the community, or answering phone calls, or answering people's emails. So you really have to have that passion um, for people and just really wanting to help. And so I do a kids cooking competition. So first we talk about food safety um, and just kind of basic cooking skills. And so we do a cooking competition. And then I've expanded that um, this past year with like a food preservation day camp where we made strawberry jam. And my commissioner really enjoyed it because a lot of kids aren't really taught kind of canning in school anymore. So that was something I was bringing back that lost art. You never know what you're gonna get <laughs> when you walk in the door. Um, so I can have my whole day planned of, oh, I'm gonna do this program and I'm gonna work on this. And then I might get a phone call about canning that I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. And then I might get a phone call about water or about cooking temperatures. And so it really keeps the day interesting. And so you never get into that rut and that mundaneness. It just, it's always changing. Well, a big occasion deserves a big time celebration. Yeah. And this month we are celebrating Ranger Nick turning the big 5-0. Now, not 50 years old, but the 50th Ranger Nick segment, which began airing over five years ago. Can you believe it? So congratulations, Nick. And to commemorate the milestone, the Monitor went back in time to Nick's early beginnings when he worked as a junior Ranger in Maryland with the man he calls his mentor, Ranger Bill Troutman. Yeah, we were able to contact Ranger Bill, and he told us even back then Nick had a special gift for working with animals, and yes, his enthusiasm was indeed contagious. 
he he was just like what you see okay and two, he was into it so it's he just loved it so you weren't asking him to work you were asking him just to fulfill his dream so work ethic was not even a question uh he he worked plenty of time over and beyond uh did whatever he needed to do but always like you see him now with that enthusiasm and just that love for doing what he's doing so yeah you could see that and and that's what makes him different from just an animal commentator or uh, informational disseminator so without further delay here now our 50th ranger nick who marked the occasion by what else focusing on something he finds near and dear to his heart well, you just heard from my all-time life mentor, Ranger Bill Troutman, the guy that got me started in this business from a very early age, seven in fact, and 30 plus years later, here I am teaching others about doing environmental education on television and using animals to do it. And I'm gonna introduce you to somebody who's really good at using animals as ambassadors, Sammy Netherton. Good to meet you, Sammy. We are at the Aware Wildlife Center just outside of Atlanta and Sammy, Introduce us to this black rat snake. Does he have a name? He does, yes. This nice. is Jeffrey. He is a black rat snake. Um, Jeffrey actually used to be out in the wild on the land that is around here. He nice. was hunting mice and rats around here, kind of helping with the rodent population. And then one day somebody was hiking up on the mountain and found him on the side of the path that they were walking along. And he looked like he'd been either uh, attacked by a dog or something Aww. else happened to him. And they brought him straight to us. and. We ended up knowing exactly who he was and he sustained some neurological symptoms that mm -hmm. allowed him not to really be able to hunt anymore and so that's why he's with us. Well and what's so special about AWARE and the work of what Sammy's doing is they're taking injured and, and orphaned wildlife out of the wild, helping them, releasing the ones that they can, but the ones that can't be released, they're using them as ambassadors of messages. And Sammy, it's so neat to hear you say Jeffrey, because naming that animal, we know from research we do right at the University of Georgia, that that helps from a learning standpoint. Such a cool thing. You know, this is non-venomous, right? Correct. Good, good. They don't pay us enough to mess with the venomous ones, right? But this is so interesting how you tell if a snake is venomous or not. It's kind of funny. Look at the shape of the eyes, vertical pupils, venomous, non-vertical, non-venomous. Or look at the shape of the head, triangular, venomous, oval shapes, non-venomous. You got to get pretty close to the head and the eyes to see what shape. So I just say when you see them out in the wild, leave them alone. Such a wonderful ambassador and a wonderful species here in Georgia. Sammy, I want to meet another one of your ambassadors and find out how you're using this other animal as a teaching tool. So let's go there next. Well, what you're looking at there is the result of an injury and so many wild animals get injured. And it's because of places like AWARE that take those animals in and then use them as ambassadors and help those animals that I wanted to bring this to you today. Sammy, who are we looking at here? So this is Sydney. She is a juvenile possum, uh, Virginia opossum, mm -hmm. and she was found in somebody's yard. Um, they've, she likely fell off the back of her mom as she was getting a little bit older, and somebody found her and she wasn't old enough to survive on her own. And we determined that she had a leg injury that, um, what you first witnessed, where we amputated the le back left leg, we amputated above the injury. Um, in order to help her survive, um, she likely would not have been able to really deal with the leg injury the way that it was when we first got her. And so because of the leg injury, she's not able to climb as well. And so that's why we deemed her not able to survive in the wild on her own. And a, now a wonderful ambassador. It's impossible to know <laughs> the difference that she's making as an ambassador and helping other animals like her. I want to introduce you to one more special ambassador next. Let's do that. So we met Jeffrey, we met Sydney. Who are we looking at here? This is Lady Owlbert Einstein. She's a barred owl, so she's gonna be the most commonly heard owl in your backyard. Um, she was hit by a truck and the person behind her saw her get hit by the truck and contacted us and brought her into us. She sustained a permanent uh, wing injury to her left wing. Mm -hmm. See that there on the left, mm -hmm. yeah. That makes it where she can't fly as well in the wild, and so she's with us permanently due to that. And, and just, folks, the cuteness factor just off the scale here. Just want to pick them up and hug them. Such a cute. Sammy, if, if folks in the Atlanta area want to come out and see AWARE, what else could they see here? Um, here we have, we have some ambassador skunks with us. Okay. Um, and they are very feisty little skunks. We also have 
some red tail hawks and broad wing hawks. We okay. have eastern screech owls and bobcats as well. Oh, and all native things, all things you can find in Atlanta, Georgia, the southeast, wonderful stuff. So if somebody's driving down the road, they find an injured owl, they find a possum in their yard, what do you recommend they do? What can we do to help these? The first step would be to contact the nearest rehabber that you can find in your state or city. Okay. Um, contacting it first is always recommended so that we can determine if they need to be left alone or if they need to be brought into a rehabber. Um, and if you're in the Atlanta area, you can always contact us by email at help at awarewildlife.org. We're going to put that on the screen and their website up there. Wonderful. Sammy, thank you so much That's for great. spending time. What an owl standing way, right? To end this 50th segment. And y'all, I got to thank you for spending 50 times with us. And I got to send a special shout out and a special thank you to Ray Delessio. He's the guy that comes out, whether it's in a cave or the runway at the world's busiest airport or chasing venomous snakes in central Georgia. He's out there every time with me shooting these shows and making me look like I know halfway what I'm doing. Thank you so much, Ray, for doing that. And our friendship is just something I really cherish. And y'all, thank you so much for watching. Check us out on Facebook. And until next time, until number 51, I'm Ranger Nick reminding you that enthusiasm is contagious, so pass it on. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on number 51 next month. See ya. Wow, thanks so much, buddy. Yeah, it's been an absolute joy to work with you as well. Here's to 50 more. And don't forget, if you miss any part of this Ranger Nick or others for that matter, you can find each and every one, all 50 of them, on our YouTube channel, the Georgia Fire Monitor. Besides Ranger Nick, there's tons of other stories to choose from. In fact, the archive goes all the way back to 2009. And while you're there, keep clicking and like the Georgia Fire Monitor Facebook page. Send us some feedback as well if you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion. Send us a message either on Facebook or the address that is on your screen, news at farm-monitor.com. When we come back, it's something that is often overlooked but plays a major role in the health and production of your cattle. I'm Scott Marvel, I'm peanut agronomist with the University of Georgia. And today we're at the Expo Field Day looking at some of the research trials that we've done on peanut. This location serves an important role for us uh, as being a location that we can do large block type research trials and look at various different things in agronomics. Um, one of the things that we're dealing with or showing in this particular uh, place is our tillage trial where we're looking at conventional tillage compared to reduced tillage both with and without cover. We've got a lot of questions lately with about half of our, maybe a little bit less than half of our acreage in reduced tillage. Does cover really bring a benefit? And so we're trying to look at that and provide answers to our growers. This location also uh, gives us a chance by doing the large block research to answer questions that growers have, you know, this year or last year uh, at our production meetings, uh, those questions help spawn research trials from year to year. And two of the things that we're looking at here at the Expo that came from those questions is inoculants, uh, whether or not these uh, new additive um, nutrient enhancement products in with the inoculant is actually beneficial for our growers or not. And the other part of this that we're looking at here is how well do some of the foliar fertilizers are being sold today to our peanut growers. How advantageous is that for our growers? Does it really bring a benefit uh, that they can see in higher yields and higher grades? So quite a few things that we're dealing with here or, or trying to show our growers here. A lot of these, like I said, come from grower ask questions and are funded through our commodity board, uh, the Peanut Commission. So this is stuff that we use here to build our recommendations off of. Finally today, keeping cattle safe and healthy during these warm summer days. Now during last week's show, Damon Jones reported on how to avoid having your herd fall victim to heat stress. Obviously, water is key. Yeah, Ray, and thanks to our friends at Alabama Extension, we continue that discussion by showing you the best water practices to use in your cattle operation. Hi, I'm Eve Brantley. I'm the Alabama Cooperative Extension System Water Resources Specialist. Both the quantity and quality of drinking water that you provide to your cattle influence their health and productivity.
Cattle typically require between 7 to 20 gallons of water per day. This can change depending on several factors, including forage quality. Green forage has higher water content than dry forage. Season. Warmer temperatures will influence the consumption rate, increasing, of course, with the warmer temperatures. Humidity also plays a role. Higher humidity decreases the need for water consumption. Lastly, physiological state can influence the amount of water that cattle need. Water consumption increases with age, pregnancy, and lactation. A typical rule of thumb is two gallons per 100 pounds of body weight per day. Many cattle in Alabama rely on surface water as their source of drinking water. Improved quality of drinking water from these surface waters will improve the palatability of water. Increased water consumption can increase the amount of food that's able to be consumed. This leads to weight gain. Water that is polluted or full of contaminants is less palatable and therefore cattle will drink less of it. The less water, the less feed, the less weight gain. Contaminants may be naturally occurring, like salinity or iron, or introduce above natural levels, things like nitrates and pathogens. Soluble salts less than 1,000 milligrams per liter are considered safe to drink. Temperature can influence the palatability of drinking water for cattle. Cattle prefer temperatures between 40 and 65 degrees Fahrenheit. When water temperatures exceed 80 degrees Fahrenheit, consumption decreases. Pathogens are disease-causing organisms that are introduced into water from untreated animal waste. Consuming water with untreated animal waste can lead to health concerns. Nutrients in stagnant water can contribute to the growth of harmful algal blooms. Cyanobacteria, or blue-green algae, release toxins, also called microcystins, that can make cattle sick when they consume water tainted with it. Nitrate can be a concern in drinking water, especially at levels greater than 300 milligrams per liter. Safe nitrate levels for livestock drinking water are below 100 milligrams per liter. Nitrate is reduced to nitrite in a cattle's rumen. Nitrite limits the ability of red blood cells to carry oxygen, posing a health concern for cattle. Forages accumulate nitrate during drought periods. This, in addition to high levels of nitrate in drinking water, pose a potential lethal combination. It is not recommended for livestock to loaf in wet areas or wet soils. This increases the potential for transmission of soil-borne bacterium, like foot rot. How do we protect water quality for livestock? The first step is to know what you have. Test your drinking water source annually. The Auburn University Soil and Water Test Lab provides a test for 16 parameters of interest, including pH, nitrates, and total dissolved solids. In the southeast, we can experience temperature extremes in the summer, followed by short periods of very cold weather in the winter. This may make freeze-proof troughs with a floating ball top a desirable option to keep water clean and cool. Fence livestock out of ponds and streams. Maintain a healthy streamside forest along streams to protect these waterways. Protect the watershed of your drinking water source by keeping a healthy plant cover and minimizing the amount of chemicals and manure that have the opportunity to be transported to the waters. Consider piping the water from a stream or a pond to a tank. Limit the amount of time that cattle have access to streams and ponds to minimize the amount of untreated animal waste that may enter these systems. If there is a health concern and you suspect water is the problem, consult a veterinarian immediately to request assistance in determining the actual health concern. Some very good tips. Unfortunately, our time together has come to an end, at least for this week. And a friendly reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening out on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's in the world of farming and with us on the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.